once again, welcome to Foundation Church. My name is John. I'm the pastor here, and today we are continuing a series we started at the very beginning of this month called Witness. It's a series built around the idea that God has given all of us a gift, and we want to help each and every one of us be better at sharing that gift. And of course, that gift is simply the good news of Jesus. It's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus who came to make it so our lives here and now could be better, but also so that we could have hope for what is to come next. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about that. But before we get into that, I have this friend who says, if you ever see me running, run, because something really bad is coming. And what this is, is his way of saying he doesn't like to run. I have to be honest, I kind of do like to run, but there was a season in my life where I thought I only liked to run no further than 400 meters, no longer than a quarter of a mile, anything longer than that was terrible and awful. And this is all to set up a story, but before I tell you the story, I have to ask you this really important question. Are you a quitter? Are you a quitter? Now, show of hands, if you raise your hand, you're a quitter. If you keep your hands down, maybe arms crossed, then we know you're really not a quitter. Go ahead, let's see. Who here's a quitter? All right, I love the honesty. So online people, you can't see this, but in person, we had a few people who raised their hands and I had a few people who were like this. So I wanna be really clear, I am not a quitter. Like, I might be the furthest thing from a quitter. I went all the way through four years of undergrad and three years of master's level classes and never dropped a class. Do you know why? Because I am not a quitter. It's not that I'm a good planner, I just refuse to quit. And sometimes there are things in my life that everyone around me is like, you, you got to cut bait on this. Stop fishing. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to fish until I catch a fish. I don't care. Like, I will not quit. But this is all to say that there was one time where I was just the world's worst quitter. So junior year of high school, I was no longer a football player. I decided football wasn't my thing. And somebody talked me into signing up for cross country. I think it was my track coach. So I decided to run cross country. Now, you may not know this, but cross country is the worst sport known to man. Awful. I think we've got a photo of what cross country looks like. Now you'll notice it's not a photo of me because I ran cross country so little there was no photos to be taken. Because see, here's the thing. I quit cross country like that. It was terrible. Now cross country, you run through hills and trails and up mountains and it rains and it gets muddy and people get not only dirty and tired, but sometimes they get bloodied up. I had no idea cross country was a full contact sport. The first time I saw that, I was like, I'm done with this sport. Like I quit playing football for a reason. I'm soft. So I quit cross country. Now, why am I telling you about that? Because I'm guessing there are things in your life that you also have quit. And I'm guessing even more that there are things in your life that you wish you could quit or you feel like quitting. If it's your job, little tiny bit of advice. Don't quit your job until you have a new job. Don't go jobless. Okay. The reality is, though, that a lot of things in life, we aren't supposed to quit. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. We're going to find ourselves worn out, worn down, and wishing we could quit. And I want to say to you today, first and foremost, don't give up. Don't quit. One of those things is our faith. It's our faith in Jesus. We not only were told that following Jesus would be difficult. As a matter of fact, as we'll hear later today, we were promised it would be hard. And so if your faith is challenging, if there are times where you're just not feeling it or it's a struggle or it feels like you're pushing a rope, if you're pushed a rope, it doesn't work very well. Don't give up because our faith is meant to be bold. And we are called to persevere even in the face of opposition. As a matter of fact, we are called to be undeterred. Undeterred by the opposition, uh, the opposition that we encounter. And a lot of times, we find ourselves inspired by other people who are walking the same journey, who they themselves are undeterred. And today, we're going to look at one of those stories it's found in your Bibles, in the book of Acts, chapter 4. Now, I'm going to be reading verses 13 to 20. And this story is looking at two followers of Jesus in the very, very early days, Peter and John. Peter and John were two of the leaders among the disciples. And they actually healed a man. And then they taught people. And it turns out when you heal somebody and then start teaching, people listen. And so people were listening. And then what happened was they were arrested 
and they went before a group in your Bible, it's called the Sanhedrin, or you might want to pronounce that word the Sanhedrin. Either way is totally okay. But I have to be honest, even if you call it the Sanhedrin, and that's wrong, nobody's going to know because nobody talks about the Sanhedrin. So don't worry too much about how you say the word. Uh, But I'm going to read this story. It picks up after Peter and John have healed somebody, they've taught, and then they've gotten arrested for it. And again, it's Acts chapter 4, verses 13 to 20. If you have your Bible like I do, we'll turn the lights on for you so you can see a little easier right now. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is God's word. It's given freely to each and every one of you. I like that. Thanks be to God. Way to go. Way to go. So look, I want to take you back to the beginning of what I read. If we look at verse 13, that's Acts chapter 4, verse 13. What we have going on here is we're told that Peter and John, when when the Sanhedrin saw them, and they realized that they were just unschooled, ordinary, They were astonished. They were shocked. But then they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And there are two things I want to highlight. First of all, those words, unschooled and ordinary. Remember, or maybe you don't know this, but at this time, for a Jewish young man, they would go to school only to the level that the teachers thought they were worthy. And so basically, to put it in contemporary terms, if you get into fourth grade and the fourth grade teacher's like, John is a dud. You're done. You're out of school right? And then if you got to seventh grade and they were like, hey, he did pretty good until seventh grade, but this is, this is it, then you're done. And you would go get different jobs. But if you made it all the way through school, then you'd become a rabbi. You'd become a teacher of the law. And so the fact that Peter and John did something other than be rabbis meant automatically that they were not the brightest crayons in the box. They weren't the smartest among their peers. They were deemed not worthy for the best profession. And so when the Sanhedrin, which is made up of the bright crayons, sees them, they immediately say, they are unschooled, they are ordinary, or maybe to put it in our terms, they're normal. They're just like you and I. They're not the best of the best, the cream of the crop. They're just regular people. And yet what Peter and John were doing was extraordinary. It was incredible. It was beyond what the bright crayons were doing. It was something a level above. And that's where they took note that while these guys were normal, they had been with Jesus. And this is what made them extraordinary. And I want to remind you that whether you feel like you're the the brightest and the best or you feel like you're just normal, just like a regular person, the encounter with God is what makes us extraordinary. The interaction with God is what allows us to do beyond what we think we can. Now, the story doesn't stop here with verse 13. It goes on to verse 17. In verse 17, we have the Sanhedrin talking. And they're trying to figure out what they do because Peter and John did this extraordinary thing. They healed a man. And then they began to teach with power and authority. And so they say, well, what do we do? And they said, finally, we must warn them. Speak no longer to anyone in this name. And that name, of course, is Jesus. We must warn them. That word warn doesn't mean warn. It means threaten. We must threaten them. That's what's going on here is they're being threatened. There will be consequences if you continue to speak in Jesus' name. And this is further opposition, right? At this point, they've already been arrested. Now they're being threatened with something more. And we know from the early church, the accounts of these early Christians, that the opposition they faced was slightly different than the opposition perhaps you and I face today. Because not only would they be arrested, they would be beaten. Not only would they be beaten, they were put to death. 
out of the original disciples of Jesus, all of them except for one was killed for his faith in Christ. And each one of them continued to profess their faith up until their death. Now contrast that at least with the opposition that I have experienced in my life. Maybe you run in tougher crowds, but for me, when I want to talk about my faith, the opposition I get is sometimes people will stereotype me. They'll say, well, like, you're just a pastor. You're one of those people. You're a Christian. You go to church. Or sometimes they won't just stereotype me. They will reject me. I will start to talk to them about my faith, and they will say, oh, I got to stop you right there, Padre. That's enough of that. We don't talk about politics or religion here. Or maybe if you get a really mean person, they'll even say mean words to you. Like, I know you're kind, and I don't like them, and I don't want anything to do with you. Now, that's slightly different, though, than imprisoned, beaten, and killed. The opposition we experience nowadays is a little bit softer, I think. The story doesn't stop here. I want to take you on to verse 20. Because in verse 20, we see Peter and John's response. At this point, they've been arrested and they've been threatened. And they've been told there will be consequences. And in verse 20, they say, hey, do what you got to do, but for us, we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. In other words, they're saying we're not going to stop. We will continue speaking. We will be undeterred, right? And this is this truth about Christianity. And the question is why? And it's not, again, because they were so great, but it's because they had such a great encounter and experience with Jesus. It's because the one they were following and being faithful to was so great. That's why they couldn't stop. And that is true just as it was then for you and I today. The God that we follow is still great today. And that's why we say that our faith isn't one of timidity, but rather our faith is bold. We're called to be bold in our faith, and we're called to share things with people sometimes that while we see it as good news, they say, keep that to yourself. And yet we're meant to be undeterred with that, right? Undeterred is the goal and is the theme for today. We want to be witnesses, but we don't want to give up at this first sign of opposition, at the first struggle, at the first obstacle that we encounter, we don't want to just quit. And so we want to keep moving, keep going. Now, the reality is that it's not that there might be opposition. There will be opposition. It's not that you, you might encounter people giving you a hard time. You will encounter people giving you a hard time. If you are not running into opposition then that means that probably you are not following Jesus very closely and you are likely not sharing that good news with anybody else. Because see, in John chapter 15, verse 18, this was near the end of Jesus' life. Jesus was talking to his disciples about his own death and he said to them, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Jesus is saying, guys, when you run into this opposition and this struggle, realize that this is part of the deal. The world rejected me first, and so of course, if you're following me, it's going to reject you. This is a promise, and, and it's discouraging for me at least when I encounter new Christians who've never experienced opposition in their faith, and all of a sudden they run into it, and they feel like sad and disheartened, and they think, well, I thought if I started following God, everything would get better, and since I've been following God, things have gotten harder, and so I always try to encourage people, like, that was kind of the deal we signed up for. And if nobody told you that, it's like you were sold a broken vacuum cleaner and they didn't tell you it was broken, right? Like, but I think the opposition that we encounter is a blessing, not a curse. It's better for us because it means that we're out of step with a world that is broken, a world that is hurting, a world that is lost. And when you try to shine light into darkness, sometimes the darkness recoils. Now look, I want to continue on with this idea because the reality is that the, the kind of the, the tenacity that we have, it comes from an encounter with God. Again, it doesn't come from us. It's not because we are so tough or so great or because we work so hard and want it so bad, but rather because we've encountered such a great, such an incredible God. Now to get into this, though, I have a really, really simple question for you, and this is have you ever had an experience like that with God? Have you ever had a powerful experience with God that you can point to and say, wow, that was God in my life? Now, if the answer is yes, just raise your hand. 
If it is no, keep your hands down. But have you ever had an experience like that? Now, just, just for everyone's edification, I want to say it's like 75% of the room. And that's great. And the weird thing is, if we were to take the time to share stories of our encounters with God, they would probably sound vastly different. And some of us, we would all say, that's, that's for sure. And others of us, we'd hear and we'd say, hmm, maybe. It's really cool the way God works because we are different. And God interacts with us differently. Now, I ask you this question because I want to share an encounter I had with God. And it's not like the heavens opening up and James Earl joins his voice and a light and a dove coming down and like, well done. It took time. And honestly, you may look on it and be like, hmm, I don't know if that was really God, John. But what I know for me is that this particular encounter has vastly impacted my life ever since. And so I'm going to share it with you. It starts out when I was a little bit younger than I am now. My Kids were two-thirds of what they are now, which means I only had two of them. Uh, and I was in seminary. My family was poor. I think we actually had, let's go with that picture. I think we have a picture of the family. There we go. So it's a really high-quality photo because photos at that time were incredibly high-quality. Uh, and you'll notice that's me with no gray hairs and Emily, my oldest, and Hannah, my middle. And we didn't even have an idea of a Gideon yet, so... That's why I got to see him earlier, so all my kids are loved now. So we were living in this really terrible apartment in Smithsburg, Maryland, and I was attending seminary as a full-time student, and Crystal apparently was just having babies full-time, because we had been married uh, like two years at this point, and we had two kids. We were like, bam, like, you know, people kept saying to me, like, do you know how this works? And I was like, I think so, like, I'll stop drinking the water. We were really, really poor. And I think I've shared about this before. It was so bad that like if I bought a candy bar at the gas station, Crystal was calling me 15 minutes later. What, what are you buying at the gas station? You know, like I, I don't think text alerts were a thing, but it was like she had them because she knew every time. It's like, I, I was really hungry. I haven't eaten yet today. I wanted a candy bar. And she's like, we have food at home that you can, you know. Before she had Emily, Crystal worked at Pizza Hut. It was the greatest job she's ever had from my perspective because she would bring home free food and we could eat Pizza Hut. Uh, but she was long past her Pizza Hut days. So we ate the 69-cent frozen pizzas from Martin's Grocery Store in Hagerstown, Maryland that we would buy, and, and that was a meal for us, 69 cents. That's glorious. We couldn't afford anything. It was so bad that our very first winter in that apartment, we couldn't heat it. We couldn't afford to heat it. We got the first heating bill, and we were like, oh, my gosh. And so we shut down all of the house except for one bedroom, Emily's bedroom. And we moved our mattress into her bedroom, and we lived in her bedroom. And I remember, like, running to the bathroom and running out of the bathroom because it was so cold everywhere else in the house. And this is what we did, and we foolishly didn't tell anybody. We kept it a secret. But we were also so poor that we were really afraid when we found out we were pregnant with Hannah. Like, people were going to think less of us. Like, why do you keep having kids if you're so poor? But probably no one knew. But the thing that we did do all the way through that time was we gave 10% of the money that we got back to God. Every week, we gave 10% of our income to God. And we did it knowing exactly where it went. I mean, I'm the pastor of the church. Like, I knew right where that money was being spent. It was mostly being spent on electric bills and heat bills at the church. And I knew for sure that probably that money would be better paying for electric bills and heat bills in my house. But I was convinced that this was my way to be faithful to God. This was my way to say, even when I didn't feel it, God, I trust you. I trust that you will take care of me and my family. Now, it went like this for a few years. In my very last year of seminary, there's this couple in the church, Melvin and Mary Lewis were their names. Melvin and Mary were great. I love them. They had my family over for their Christmas Eve supper, and then they would always read the Christmas story. It was just the greatest thing. But I had been the pastor of this church for three years. And on the third year, Melvin and Mary came to me and they said, you know, we had started a scholarship several years ago for somebody who was going into the ministry and we'd like to give you that scholarship. There's not a lot of money in it, but we'd like to give you what's left of it to go toward your seminary. And what was left of it paid for my third year of seminary. So I didn't have to pay any money for seminary. Which meant that all of a sudden the $15,000 a year that I was paying to a seminary 
was money that I got to pay to myself. That winter, we had heat in the whole house. It was amazing. We ate $1.50 frozen pizzas instead of 69 cent frozen pizzas. We even once in a while would go to the gas station and buy a candy bar and not yell at each other about it. I felt so rich because this couple, three years into my tenure there, said, hey, we have this money that we'd like to bless you with. And I knew right where the money came from. And the cynic would look at it and say, why didn't they give that to you three years sooner? Because you were still their pastor three years prior. I had no idea that my family was living in one bedroom. But I look at it and say, that was God blessing me. That was God responding to my faithfulness and saying, John, I will always be faithful to you. I always look back on that story when I'm stressed about other things. Sometimes about money, sometimes about people, sometimes about health, sometimes about just like nonsense. Because I'm one of those people. I stress about nonsense sometimes. And I always remember that God saw me through that. And of course, God will see me through this. Now, my life is filled with a number of these kinds of stories. This is one that I thought maybe would resonate with some. But at the same time, maybe some of you would be like, that doesn't sound like God at all. I share this with you to encourage you. Hopefully to inspire you, but also to be able to say that when we have those divine encounters, those encounters with God, it's often when we ourselves are uncomfortable, when it's not fun, and it's not easy, and sometimes it's downright scary. Those are the times often that God makes himself known the most to us. And so if you find yourself in one of those seasons where it's not fun and it's not easy and maybe it's even a little scary, start looking around for God because I guarantee you he's there and he's probably already hard at work. Now we want this because it's these experiences that are going to allow you to be undeterred moving forward in your life. These are the experiences that are going to let you be faithful the next time you hit a bump in the road, the next time you struggle or worry. And of course, today we're talking about witnessing, sharing our faith with other people, with a hurting and broken world that needs good news, but doesn't always want to hear it. And so not only do I want to say this idea that we encounter God when we go beyond, when we move past the comfortable. I think we got a slide for that, right? We encounter God when we go beyond No, there we go. Not only do I want to say that to inspire you, but I also want to say that, hopefully, because we're going to give you this little easy application step, this really simple way that you can begin to practice what I preached today. As it pertains to your faith, we want you to go beyond what's comfortable. We want you to share your faith with someone else, and for some of you, just thinking about it, stressful and uncomfortable. So I'm not suggesting get a bullhorn and go to the corner and start screaming. As a matter of fact, I would suggest you never do that. I do not think that's ever a good way to share your faith. What we are suggesting is perhaps share your faith, something about your faith, something about your experience with God, with somebody who's on your team. This would be like your spouse, your parent, your child, your sibling, your friend, Somebody who goes to church with you. Turns out if you talk to somebody in this room about your faith, they're at least going to listen to you. Now maybe you already talk about your faith with your spouse and your children and your parents and your friends and your co-church attenders. Take a step beyond that. Talk about your faith with somebody who's not your parent, your spouse, your children, your friend, your co-church attender. The idea here is to practice this to go a little past what's comfortable. And this doesn't have to be like, hey, like you gotta drop to your knees and pray and accept Jesus and get saved today, kind of a conversation. This can just be as simple as, today in church my pastor talked about sharing our faith and I wanted to share a little bit about what I think and hear what you think about that. This is a really simple conversation. It's really, really easy. But practice like this will help us get better and better and better and allow us to go further and further and further until we're making a really, really big impact in the world. Now again, today we're talking about witnessing. And this is all about the idea that God has given us a gift 
And we just want to get better at sharing that gift with others. We want to learn how we can more effectively share that gift. Today, we talked specifically about the idea that we want to be undeterred. There's a reality that we are going to run into opposition. If we're following Jesus and we're being faithful and we're trying to do what he tells us to do, there are going to be times where we're going to hit bumps in the road. The past bumps, the past struggles will inform the current reality as well as the future uncertainty. Those past difficulties will allow us to be undeterred now and in the future. But if you hear nothing else, if you remember nothing else about what I talked about today, you don't hear that my wife yelled at me for buying candy bars at the gas station, which sometimes still happens. I love gas station candy bars. What I really want you to remember is this reality that we are called beyond. You are called beyond. Pray with me if you would. God, help us to not only hear you, to not only experience you, but to be faithful to that call, to trust where you're leading, even if it pushes us beyond what feels safe, beyond what feels comfortable, beyond what we know into the unknown. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.